back in the beginning of the 1970s, decided to go fishing. All I wanted to do is go fishing. Out of Cadwith, where my ancestors have been for many years, probably hundreds of years, decided to get a, a 16 foot punt and a five horse outboard, went off for two years, went fishing in that, and then another two years with dad and the 18 footer, and then we had to Samantha the Rose, which she was a lovely boat, built up weight for, well, I don't know, 1976 and went on to just over 12 months ago, 14 months ago, when I was crabbing all those years. From 150 pots, we went up to 400 pots. Decided to give it a go on something else. And I've always wanted to catch fish with a ring net, per seine, and going around fish and pursing them up. And I experimented with a pole and a transducer and all things like that, and had a go in the Samantha Rose help of Spencer Carter with a bow thruster and a generator and to hydraulics and all this. I had to go catching pilchers and I'd done it very well. I did and caught them. We had 300 stone just off Penzance Promenade off the swimming pool. Nick Ells came with us. Lovely. First catch I ever had. Well after many other catches in her winter come on I decided to get a bigger boat and she was called a Penrose. Stuart Williams done her up, he used to belong to Ben Pyle down Fourth Eleven. Stuart done her up and she was a handsome boat. She was built up Timmouth Way for midwater trawling for sprats and Stuart had done two years doing her up because he knew deck, another engine, tanks, electrics, a lot, lovely. Anyway, got this Penrose boat from Fort Eleven with help with bank money and, and all that. We had an awful summer last summer trying to catch these fish because they were very quick in the summer and it needs a bigger net to do it. I lengthened the net back to the original length of the Renault, even though my boat's 30 footer. We, we done it very safely and effectively, but couldn't catch a fish all summer. Eventually we went down New Lynn, end of October, when we started catching pilchards and we caught 20 tons of pilchards in 12 days fishing during the three week period. And I'd been very safety conscious all my life in fishing. When I had to smunt the rose, I'd done lots of methods of fishing, from monofilament lining to sharking, basically crabbing. And I, owed, I had a radar, and, a, and which is very safe and sufficient bit of equipment, a life raft, flares and all the rest of it. So when I had the pen rose, I made sure that I was safe on her. And I had the life wrap again and the radar and the flares and all the rest of it, but the last catch I had I didn't get back with the boat or the fish. The f she she capsized and sunk on me. Do I need a ticket? for a boat which is just under 16 metres. Well, Locally known as Nutty Noah, Martin's never felt compelled to conform. He was willing to be scoffed at for trying to revive the pilchard fishing industry. The penalty of being underinsured has become apparent. After paying the bills, there is nothing left. Fishing is all he knows. He must get another boat. He's been told about a 40-foot boat that's for sale in Ireland. So he's arranged with the bank for an overdraft to cover the deposit. He will worry about the rest of the finance when he returns. On the way to Ireland. <laughs> Rather a lot of signs to read at the moment. <laughs> the bridge is over there, but we're going the wrong way. I think we are. Hang on. Not being familiar with the roads outside of Cornwall, and after many wrong turns, Martin finally arrives at Fishguard and boards a ferry with just minutes to spare. Oh, he's acknowledging me coming in here. Hey, she's 
moving. We're here, Jed. The following morning, Martin sees a boat that he's travelled all the way from Cornwall for. His first impressions is that with a tidy up and a splash of paint, she's ideal for his needs. Essential for me to have the track in when I'm pushing. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I'll show you. Slick, that's, that's just to yeah. tell you that it's not to be relied on as a navigation. It's a navigation aid. It's not the real thing. Yeah. They don't want you to be saying, "Oh, I'm grand all the time looking at it." Like that's how um, Rachel so, Harvey sank down to the Sillies. I think probably they was they was going by the blotter as as I gospel, as uh, life. Yeah. The rock moved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cheers. Man. Hi, I hope you have a good journey. Now. Martin is relying on the bank to come up with the rain in balance. This could be a major hurdle. Now I'm going to leave the truck and get on up to the bank and see them, put it to them how it's been done. And a very good friend of mine, Phil Lockley, has done a really good job on presenting it all in proper typewriting from a computer. So it's self-explanatory, the same as the graph, but I'm very nervous, but also very confident. So let's hope the next time you'll see it, it'll be Reba, Reba. <laughs> well, good luck, Marley. Oh, thanks, old buddy. <laughs> oh, never mind you. Oh well, what we didn't look forward to now, Jed's a pasty. They've, they've, unfortunately, they won't give a loan on 100%. They need, they need some collateral, need me to put down a minimum of 30,000 pounds. So I gotta find, I gotta find 30,000 pounds somewhere or something or some kind person to give us hand. The, interest on the, the bank has suggested to Martin that if his wife will put her house as security, so they may reconsider his application. 40% of it, 40% of it, uh, no, 40,000 pound of it would be uh, less interest and I wouldn't have paid so much back. So perhaps it'll work out right in the end. I've got to get around Sally now. <laughs> and pasty, that's the next thing. Get around and get pasty pretty. All right, cheers. Right, I mean, we've we've done quite a bit of thinking about the situation, and as we need collateral to borrow this money for the boat, and Sally, my wife, doesn't want to put the house up, seeing we're married, we thought we'd go about it in this fashion. So we've got to go to the registry office and get a divorce, <laughs> get a divorce papers, and say myself, half of the house is mine. I'm sorry, I'm putting it up for a new boat. <laughs> Martin has convinced his wife to have the house valued in the hope that it would provide enough collateral for his borrowings. Despite this, the bank are still not willing to lend the amount needed. In desperation, and with the help of other fishermen, all who can relate to Martin's situation, a salvage operation is mounted. After inspection by divers, the Penrose appears to be in a repairable condition. A large beam trawler has offered to lift her from the bottom. Um, plan is that this here will go through the boat, actual boat, and then we can tie a rope past the ear or wire fast to there to lift her up. Hopefully get the Penrose back up again and working. How important is it to, to get the Penrose oh, back up? Flipping. Really important because I ain't got no other boat, Jed. He's... Luckily, um, Billy Stevenson said I can 
over up one of the beamers, the biggest beamer over the other side there, the Cornish one. And that, the weight of the boat in the water is probably not so heavy as what their beams are. It's important so as I can either get her back working again and or sell her. Hopefully I can borrow some money to uh, again to try and get her back in a working order so I can sell her to to earn work, earn some money on the sale of the boat, which may well be helpful in uh, buying the other one. On the video, as as we've seen, it's the transom and the starboard side, the keel and the stem. That's all all right. What the port side is like, I wouldn't like to say. I would have thought it would be wore away quite badly and have to replace, I would guess, six planks and four frames, I guess that. They're taking a the beamer out tomorrow at about eight, nine o'clock because the tide's going back. So she'd she, she be outside the harbour because she can't go out low water or come in low water. And uh, then we'll go out, we'll go out after dinner Hopefully then, and get her up in the afternoon and come in here high water. Probably five o'clock. We could well be coming in with her five, six o'clock and put her on the put her on the beach over the other side. Martin finalizes the details with the ship's owner, Billy Stevenson. on the left hand side should have been made past the winch. You don't come away. It is. The winch, the winch, it's got a square bit of pipe on it there that's sticking out. So we got the winch on one. Martin is concerned. It's not going to plan. And it doesn't look good. Penrose has come to the surface. Stern first. And that's taken all the strain. Devastation. All Martin can do is watch as Penrose breaks up and is reclaimed by the sea. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get her back. She slipped and went back down in the water again. But we got the winch back and we may be able to get bits and pieces. But thank you very much. Billy and the crew members of the Cornishmen to try their best and a few other lads, divers and things who've been giving me hand. Cheers.
two weeks later, with a break in the weather, divers attach new lines to the wreck of the Penrose, and a second lift is tried. Much weight on it! I reckon we got all of them, Harvey. If we made past the net and took in Charlotte, we're going to give it a bit of a yarn or something. This time, the lift is successful, and she is towed slowly into Newland Harbour. Finally lifted onto the pier. Some chimney stack, yo. When your camera. Yeah, that's all. Nearly all in here. Come in and have a look, Jed. Even got the life life jacket back. But the thing is, as it's gone down in a lot of pressure, the bit of foam in the middle is shrunk. It should be this wide. So that won't be used again. Lots of hydraulic pipes up mothers. What else I got? Oh, loads of, I got everything back except my mobile phone and a sock and my barber coat. <laughs> everything else I got back. And, well, obviously you've got the wood and we're burning that in the fire at the moment. So I'm really pleased with the outcome. Thanks to the boys down Newlyn, Billy Stevenson. So hopefully, um, we might be able to stick it all back on another boat one day. Fortunately, I didn't have to get a divorce or um, anything to at Sally to put the house up for Clatchel, but we have actually now both agree putting the house up for Clatchel to get some money for this boat over Ireland, hopefully. And that that's gone all right. That's gone pretty. And we're we're we got the go ahead from the bank to subject to survey. That means the boat over Ireland is going to be taken out of water and surveyed the one of the electronic electrical things uh, which measures the thickness of the steel of the hull so we're going over tomorrow me and my daughter on the ferry to the same place where we've been before to see this boat so we're all we're all really excited because it's only just it's only just happened that we've able to borrow borrow the money to do it now I've been flat out getting all the gear ready to go sharking. So hopefully when we get a boat we'll go to sea and show you how it's done and hopefully come home with some fish. So we can start paying off the boat. Oh, headache. Three weeks. It should have been a week. But we got her surveyed and the survey was good. The, the sickness of the steel was the same as what she was ten years ago. And unfortunately, there was a bit of a wear in the shaft, so we had to have another propeller shaft. But um, and that took quite a while to do, and we got pretty fed up actually. And and eventually, we got it all painted up. 
So I've been down in the bilges and been everywhere. My daughter came with me, three weeks over there, no school, flipping right on. We painted her from top to bottom, from the front to the back. Handsome, got lagged every day, right up to her elbows, armpits. Stinking of bilge water, and covered in paint. And she's a lovely boat, and we had a lovely crossing, coming across from Ireland. We left yesterday at 12 o'clock, well, about 12, dinner time. And we got here and come through the harbour and it didn't take very long from the mouth of the harbour, Newland Harbour here, to the end of the new pier and me and my daughter were crying our eyes out because there was about 30 local people, my local friends and my family was all waving and it was an extremely emotional and wonderful time. Lots of people, including yourself, was wondering how he's getting on so we're back now and have a day or two off and have a good sleep. A past year or two. <laughs> <laughs> Painted the white floats. Got some day glow paint. Got 400 of these to do. And put in some paint on so I can see them when we go sharking. Only another. 399 to go. <laughs> What's the idea of the life jacket morning? Well, never be sure. <laughs> Might sink. Haven't taken off for six months. <laughs> no, I put it on to rest on them. Leaning on this is better than keeping the body up with me back. I thought it's quite comfy. It just I blow the whistle to have a bit of cup of tea. Sovereign bun and a cup of tea. Well, I, I fear for you sometimes. I mean, do you really sort of realise the gravity of the situation? You know, your, your, your house is on the line. And, you know, I mean, to be fair, this is a, a, a complete new venture as regards to the size boat and everything else. But um, I, I just hope it works out for you. But uh, are, are you sure in yourself? If I stayed here, I was going to sink anyway. And I know if I sink, the bloody house, the house is going to go. <laughs> but we, we'll just have to go to sea and try. <laughs> Take plenty of, plenty of gruff and <laughs> milk and other necessities, necessities of survival. <laughs> See if we can catch these sharks. <laughs> no, life can't be. Life can be a bit unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> Two months have been good. Two months trying to get the registration through. And been very frustrating too. Let me tell you. The, uh, the boat, seeing it come from Ireland, it had to come off the registration over there, but it's not just one place registration, it's two, because it is a fishery place. So like the MAF in this country. And they had to get written permission from the owners, the last owners, and they had to go in their system, and they do it, to knock us off the registration in Ireland. They then had to tell the MAF registration, or their equivalent, they had to tell the Irish registration people to knock it off the Irish list, and they had to tell Cardiff, who do the registration, that it's knocked off. Then another ball game. It had to come off the come on the British registration, which was quite took quite a while to do because of the the system. Once you get in the system, it's a three weeks backlog, and when yours come to the top of the pile, they deal with it. If you've got a problem which generally has, goes to the bottom of the pile again. And so it's taken two months to get the registration so as I can get a license to fish. Otherwise it, it would have been illegal and I've never done any illegal fishing. I'm going to give it a go with, with lines to see if I can catch some sharks because nobody's hardly doing it in this country. Just a few boats. 
Now this this lot here is bait, and it's octopus. See that, can you? Yep. Yeah, here they are with their tentacles hanging down here, and it's head here, and a little eyeball in here. I think his eye or something else. Hopefully, I'll be going to. I got a, a a good feeling. Oh, there's some more octopus here. A good feeling that towards Lundy would be a good way. Tell me this last this last week or two that I've been thinking that finding out where these fish are. There's some more octopus there. Isn't it? It's a better shot, isn't it? I was going to go today, but the forecast was not very good, so I haven't gone. Oh, by the way, there's Sandy will slip. At long last, two months after purchasing the Prevail, Martin can legally go to sea. With large borrowings and stopped from fishing because of red tape, this first trip has to be successful if Martin wants to stay in the fishing industry. <laughs> Only 10 hours to go, and Martin is pleased to be passing his first landmark, the long ship's lighthouse, on his starboard beam. Six hours into the journey, and Martin's low boredom threshold comes into play. <laughs> with all that rubby dubby in those little bags and it's smelling quite high when you stick your head out the door <laughs> I'd smell it on my fingernails uh, I would have thought that'll get the little old noses going get the old poor beagle's nose going I read in a book the other day you know 
that the word Corvigal can go back to the Roman times. And they said that it's, the book was saying that it was, it was very much like a pig, so they called it uh, poor, poor Beagle, pork or something like that, you know? It means nose like a pig. So it'd be nice to catch one to have a look, see what they look like. <laughs> Yeah, we'll find out tomorrow at dinner time. We'll have one then, perhaps. Morning. A bit fresh. The forecast was for six, which is fairly rough, but hopefully we'll be able to get something in the water and see if there's any here. Hopefully we'll be able to anchor up the west side of Lundy for the night. So, see you later. God, got salt in me. Oh, riva, riva, riva. I didn't notice that. <laughs> Are they got a catalog? So we'll go out and have a look again in a minute, see if there's any possibility of shutting away later on. We're at the back of Lundy Island, the western side, because it's easterly wind, and we're going to go north of the island, eight or ten miles or something like that. Two hours after shooting the lines away, they're pulled aboard. The only catch being one small shark and four total. Martin is very disillusioned. Well, this is day two. First day was absolute disaster, and I didn't want to talk about it because it was windy getting up here. Wind went, we went in anchored up, didn't we, behind the island and had something to eat, and then we the wind went away. We went out and had a go again, but. Well, soon, no sooner we got out, out to sea, the wind got up again, and it was really rough. Well, not really rough, rough enough. And that, all that awful I had, the pilchard um, hedge and banks and stuff which come from the, the pilchard works, um, made the deck ever so slippery. We had ever such a job to stand up. I thought it may have attracted a shark, but we only had that one small poor beagle, so we actually caught one went off now in the northerly direction again, hoping to um, have another go in this area before we head back. We probably, if we don't catch nothing out here, we'll probably steam halfway home and have a look around again, something like that. But I really want to spend a day and a half a night looking in this area to get it well and truly out of my system. It's really, really good. A five fish, 25 hooks. There's one, that's the last one. And come up, look at the rest. Right on, one and five, it was six. Six and 25 hooks. Reba, Reba! We nearly lost the line, so it went about three miles. No wonder with them on them, eh? Well, look at the other one now.
Yes, Marvin. Fish! <laughs> Take it quietly. 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 Quietly, down a bit. No! Yes. One, two, three. Hey! Oh, bugger! Reba, Reba, Reba! <laughs> Look at the size of that one! Woo! Turn around his tail. <laughs> Ooh, sorry about that, old buddy. Oh, aren't they beautiful? God's creatures, yeah, that's for sure. Beautiful, aren't they? He'd been on the bottom, look, with the sand on it. Martin was very pleased with the catch. I asked him what his comments would be to people watching this film and feeling sick, watching these creatures being caught. I don't know about this public view on cruelty, and I don't know whether there is. That's your opinion, but the um, fish die when they're in the water, whether they're in the net or whether they come in the boat. A lot of people in the country and in the world don't like things dying. I don't like things dying, especially a beautiful thing like a shark. I, I really think the shark design is probably the most efficient and the most beautiful design creature in the world. And I could probably say the same again with, to a peregrine falcon or to a butterfly. All these, all these creatures of the world are beautiful, aren't they? And the colors are like colours of a fresh blue shark is just stunning. Like a, a rook walking around in full plumage. Now, rook in full plumage, they're normally black, but if you catch them in the sun February month, when he's looking his best, before they nest, he got that purpley, greeny old blue tint on and it's handsome. So, going back to the death and the sharks, I don't think that there is a problem with the general public on the issue. There is a certain amount of feelings in certain groups, but people got to eat. If you didn't kill the cows, or the sheep, or the fish, what we all gonna be rabbits and just eat vegetarian food all the time. A lot of people like eating fish. Now you gotta face up to the facts that there is slaughterhouses which kill animals. And the, this country has not gone into a slaughterhouse that people are frightened and they don't like to see death, meat, blood, drip, 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 all the rest of it. I mean, we don't like cruelty, but at the same time, we like meat. So it's an interesting issue, issue isn't it? Further attempts at shark fishing proved unsuccessful. So on the strength of another bright idea, Martin and Sally just returned from a 200 mile round trip having bought some whelk pots. Seeing we can't go um, after pilchers, we haven't got any net, 
Jimmy can't afford a net at the moment. We'll have a go see if we can catch these little old sea snails. When they're little old whelks through on the bottom, they got a they got a little sniffer sticking up, and they sniff and they sniff where it is like this, and they suck onto it, and they skid up over the side and fall in. And when they're in, they eat the bait. But when they want to get out, they can't get out because this is stopping them. They can't, their little sucker can't keep themselves sucked, stuck on the netting. Well, we brought these welt pots back. Another new investment into another fishery. Might sound that like I'm perhaps doing something different again, but I am doing something different, yes, but I've got to do it because the license I have it's a Category C license. It's, it's fishing isn't quite as simple as some people may think. You can get a Category A and a Category B and a Category C. Category A, from what I can gather, you can catch fish which are on pressure stock and the math will dish out um, figures of what you're allowed to catch and you've got to chuck the rest away. It's, I mean, you, talk for hours to this about that politics but the category C which I have I've been told that I can catch shellfish whelks is one of those conger eels or ling bass and mullet are in in those as well which I'll be able to hopefully catch with that that net which I'm going to put in the boat but I certainly got to find something to catch every day to get myself working Martin arranges to meet a local crab fisherman at Helford, who's been finding whelks in his crab pots. The potential buyer needs to know the meat content in order to offer Martin a price. It will save a lot of time if Martin can get the whelks analysed at this early stage. Day's work. Day's work. Yeah. Critters. Is that what they're looking for? We don't know. I hope so. They aren't reddish, are they? No, no red in them, are Let's hope they aren't dog whelks. He reckons they're common whelks. A dog whelk is smooth. Well, they aren't smooth, are they? They're ever so rough. I reckon they're the critters. Could well be my future here, Jed. I wonder what they taste like. Oh, Christ, my what they taste like. Not bad. I didn't even say ouch, did you? <laughs> Still wriggling now. <laughs> Animal rights people will be on me, even. Remember, it's like a prawn if you ever had a raw prawn. If you ever had a raw shrimp or prawn? Yeah. Like that, I mean, tough. Rubbery. Pepper's a rubbery. I think that happened there, we didn't know. Oh, look at all that slime there. Oh! Only good shy ones, John. Oh, you're my bugger eater. You carry on. I try lots of things, man. Come try that. I'll put it off there. Yeah. I've seen enough, I'm off. <laughs> I'll still be chewing time I get home. Ha ha! Chris has phoned me. Martin now needs to contact the buyer and get the sample to Wales for quality test. Oh yes please, could you ask him to give me a ring regarding sample of whelks? Yes, yes. No. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, not, not lately, no, no. Well, could have done. You have you? You have. Yeah, there we are, see. <laughs> oh, like winter, yeah. Time, no, I've got time. Yeah, I've got tea here, thank you very much, yeah. <laughs> I'd stirring it my mitt.
pen actually. Making sure I got some sugar in them, but I can't feel that. Probably dissolved. I know it's bad for me. Lots of things are bad for you, aren't they? Mmm. Well, it's been very nice talking to you. Yes, I am. Yes. Yeah, you also. Yes. Okie doke. Goodbye now. There isn't anybody there really. <laughs> All I can hear is the orchestra's gone. I love the white rose in its splendor. I love the white rose in its bloom. I love the white rose so fair as it grows. It's the rose that remind me of you. Remind me of you. Oh, I'm glad it's your phone, Jed. It's costing you fortune. <laughs> And we'll put one charge here, <laughs> another charge there, and perhaps one there. We'll detonate that at New Year's Eve. Oh, that's all right. All right, thanks very much. Bye-bye. Oh, thanks, Jim. Give me a ring tomorrow morning. Right on Jed, well here we are again down Newlin, we're doing a bit more work on the boat, a lot more work actually. Since we spoke last we've had a, a phone call from the buyer from these, from these whelks up Wales and he said they're the right kind because we sent a sample away, remember, from the man up Elford? Sent that sample away, he phoned up and said right on, that's just what the doctor ordered. Top TV. <laughs> yeah, after after all these weeks now putting up with gales and all this welding, we're actually ready. Which is pretty. I've got loads of bait up on board. And when when it's in the morning like this it uh, reality in the poor light of day in the coldness of the mornings is it home a bit more too doesn't it because it you think flipping heck what have I done here and I haven't burnt any very much yet the uh, pots are on board and we bait them up and put them in the water and let's hope, hope for the best but certainly in the morning I got very mixed feelings with with what I got to find to pay off for this loan and uh, it would be all it would have been all too easy to sit on my butt and go on the doll but I'm glad I done the right thing and when the sun come up later on I'll be even more positive but in the morning he's he's a bit more worrying than what it would be in the day because in the day you've got other things to do haven't you you've got other people around to give you confidence and the ones that don't give you confidence or chat in a way whatever
Happy as a pig in the mud. Going over all right. This one here is looking pretty, isn't it? All coming back to me now, what I learned in Ireland. Put it one a bit calmer. Four, five to six. They're giving seven to eight. So if we can get this one over the side, that'd be nice. See how we get on, it's quite, quite workable. Till I fall over. See what I'm doing because the lights are packed up. <laughs> a long day, 16 hour day. All the gears in the water, what we wanted to put in. Six strings of pots, of welt pots, and it must be three strings of 40, three, four, that's 120. And, uh, well, 250 pots, I suppose, something like that. But it got a bit rough in the end, didn't it? But I'm glad we've done it now. Lots of bait in there. We'll give them a couple of days now. A couple, three days, perhaps, and see if there's any whelks. Hopefully we'll film them coming up. Because of poor weather, it's four days before the pots are pulled aboard. A lot depends on a good catch. If you've got if you've got a nice gun or a, a big piece of wood, just smack me on the back of the head when I'm walking up the key. Yeah, the the first one was 22 welts for 44 pots. Next one had about six in it. Another one had about three. Another one had about one. Yeah, and the last one here, three mile boy again, must have had about 20 and 20 or 30 in it and. All the bait still in there, and really, really bad news. Today may have been a disaster, but there was worse to come. The um, 
outcome of this, well, fishery doesn't look all that good, and uh, the future don't look all that good at the moment. The uh, last 25 years fishing in Cadwith has been grand. I've seen the pilchards and uh, caught them, got another boat and sank. Got another one, put my house up, got this other one, got this Prevail, a lovely boat. Couldn't afford a net because he was more expensive. The license for her was more expensive than what we thought. But on top of that, without worrying too much about it, is uh, we've got a first same fleet from Spain. Exploratory fishing here and more to come next summer. Don't look very good, do it? Because of licensing restrictions and the threat of the Spanish fleet, Martin isn't sure what to do next. He decides to bring into action a net that has been stored in his loft for many years. The size of the mesh means, however, that it won't catch pilchards. Well, what do you uh, think of the situation so far, Sally? Well, it's a right old struggle. We keep on trying new things. Just hope that the next one will work. Just want enough, really, to pay off the standing orders and direct debits each month. I'm not worried about luxuries and things like that. Just keep on the right side of the bank. Sally and Martin's wedding reception. I was born and bred in London, never thought I'd marry a fisherman and have my wedding reception in a fisherman's loft. We did, didn't us? Yeah. We had a really good time. Best wedding ever, wasn't it? Yeah. People still talk about it now, 16 mm -hmm. years later. Yeah. Smashing. Over a hundred people. 180. 180 was it? Mm. And 200 chicken eggs. <laughs> <laughs> 200 pints of blue angry beer and 80 pints of own brew. Uh, mm. Lots of wine. But you didn't think you'd be pulling a net out from here, did you? No, I certainly didn't. Well, perhaps it'll catch lots of bass and mullet or something like that, seeing we can't afford a culture net. Yes, that's right. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Anyway. And hopefully we won't sink again. Yes. Financially, not physically this time. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Yes. Thank you for your help anyway. That's the idea. So I can't really afford to carry on with the, the try and look for these bass and mullet. So we, so we put that net away again. He's a lot of work, I know, but he's he's one of the things that we got to have a, a sonar, we've got to have patience and um, time, and we haven't got any of those. Well, I got patience, but I ain't got the time and the sonar. So we put the net back in the loft, and hopefully, uh, when we get some French French francs. We'll um, go to France and see if we can get this net. There's a friend of mine from Guernsey has uh, got a net lined up um, down Concarno. And next next job, hopefully, will be going across that channel instead of the Bristol Channel. We'll go across the English Channel and uh, see if we can get her. The net is still over there, but I got, um, I paid the money out and I haven't brought the net back because it's a bit too much of a problem getting the net to the ferry and the ferries would leave in awkward times. Couldn't get a vehicle. Right on, thanks for turning up and taking me home. That's if you are going to take me home, anyhow. Well, I think it's probably halfway, Mark. <laughs> Hello. 
country of gold followed me up. They think they're going to catch some fish, I suppose. Ready, Sean? Here she is. Hard work, he's he's a feral net, isn't he? Hard work when it's just two of you. Thanks to George and Woodstock, the, the firm down at Falmouth where they're selling the wood. Thank you very Thanks much for taking me up there. My pleasure, it's been a wonderful day. <laughs> <You liar. laughs> Rachel will think it was wonderful. Yeah. She's oh. out there, peace and quiet. <laughs> 200 miles longer than we thought. The net is in need of repair before it can be used to catch pilchards. Martin's family do what they can to help. Don't want to do it. Catch all of it now. Grandma usually does it. Oh yes, well good practice for you too, for when you mentioned jeans. Cafes around Cornwall are all closed. The visitors are gone home and the tamarind trees are bending over, touching the ground. Good gale here now, southerly gale on the lizard. Most southerly point in England. And not very nice out there. Well, we got the net on the back of the truck. We haven't got it in the boat, but we got it out the barn. It was too wet and windy and awkward to put it in the boat today, but we're going to put it in the boat tomorrow if it isn't too windy and rainy. Well, I come down here now and again to have a little think, have a look at a, not to drive off the cliff, because it's quite easy down here. There's a 200 foot drop down there. But I had to sit here, get rocked about in the truck, in the wind, and have a think about all sorts, like you do, and sometimes have a think about what weather we're going to have through this winter because up to now it's been gales after gales after gales and even today we've got a ship gone ashore down Mosul four men picked off by the helicopter 15 or 13 men 200 mile off Spanish Spanish trawler in trouble and we've got this steady pattern of gales coming in I'm a bit worried about it and Sally's a bit worried about it obviously because we haven't got no fat on us. Most most birds and animals, they get plenty of fat on them, don't they? When they're when there's plenty of worms around, plenty of fish, and seals are eating these fish, and they get half inch or four inches of fat all around them. I know Sally keep telling me I'm overweight, but um, this is for me. This fat is for me. I gotta survive. <laughs> I was I was trying to allude to. Um, Financial fat. We haven't got any spare hackers, so I'm a little bit concerned. If I was a, a creature, I would probably starve to death. Because uh, <laughs> I haven't planned ahead. I haven't caught enough in the summer to get by the winter. But there is a little, hopefully, little bit of good luck coming out of this. Somebody the other day told me that you may be able to ask the bank to put us on hold. <laughs> Hibernate. <laughs> Put us on all. <laughs> Put us on all for 12 months till we get on our feet. You'll be swept off your feet. You go out in this scale, you go over the top of the cliff.
Poor weather had prevented Martin from going to sea, so it was fortunate for him that the bank did agree to put his repayments on hold. Now, with calmer conditions, Martin sets out to try the net he brought in France. The last time that Martin fished for pilchers like this, he lost his boat. Tensions are running high. This net is much larger, and Martin knows that once again, he could be near the limit. That one isn't coming in. It's meant to be coming in. I said bring it in. It's going out. In is the other way, isn't it? Oh, you fucking wound up the fucking thing wrong way. Major problem. Concentrate on that. Put it on fast gear and wind up. Here's our first fish, fish Jed. He's a little a sprattler. And a culture here. And there's a lot of gold looking, so let's open some more in there. So many different things to do. It's easy when you've got four hands or three hands, but two hands is a bit too much. There would probably be, as much the mark we shot would probably fill up all these bins or more, but they would have got out through the holes. And as you can see, there's sprats and pilchards. Quite a successful day, although it's very frustrating, wouldn't it? It's well to me. It looked very hard work, like yeah. undermanned, really. Yeah, undermanned, all right. We um, we managed to get in over the side because the main thing was get it over the side and, and purse up. But we only just managed to do that because the winch is in the wrong place. I didn't realise that until today. Well, he's. Been pretty handy looking at the footage of the net going over the side, flying out over and working out where the winch is going to go. And I'd been brought back to reality for when I spoke to my crew member on the telephone to ask him if he could give me a hand. He replied saying he will if he can, but he got a bit of family commitments. His, his 13 year old son, who's had cancer, has. Uh, the operation to remove the tumour was unsuccessful so he got to be moved from Trillist up to Bristol so on hearing that terrible news all I could say was I'm terribly sorry to hear about that and if there's anything I can do 
don't hesitate to ask and don't worry about his job his job will always be there so in it in it so meaningless sometimes when you're trying to trying to survive catching fish or whatever job you've got when you've got a serious illness in the family or if you have an accident or anything like that is job money and surviving is meaningless when it comes down to your actual life which is really precious Did he say yet? He told me he had 200 stones. That's only because I told him. Oh. I don't mind you taking all the credit. I, I, think, it, I think it's really good that you're spot on. That's a three stone piece of cake. Yeah. 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 No, he's uh, he gave up there for a while. I don't blame him. Really, he's uh, I would have given up a long time ago myself. He's still very ill, having to go to Bristol, but uh, he'll pull through. He's determined. He's young, and determined now. So, you no know, fingers crossed. And uh, well, I wish him all the best. Really. Yeah. Well, you know, he's a he's a fighter. And uh, well, I wish you all the best. Yeah, well, I wish you and the boy all the best. Thank you, well, thank you very much, Jed. Thank you. You know, I'd like to see him out here with me one day, actually. Hopefully, one day we'll be sharing the same boat berth. All right, and Jed, well, thank you very much for asking, and uh, I'll see you soon. Well, all day. That was to be the last time that Dave sailed with Martin. Many ships only put to sea around 15 days. The report to the meeting says some fish markets have had no fish to sell and fuel costs have also hit viability. Ralph Harris, eat your heart out. Tiny kangaroo down spur. Spare, I got spare time because it's easterly wind. Not so easterly wind now, it's easterly wind. And lots of it, gales. And it's getting a bit frustrating, so I thought I'd try and unwind a bit and do some painting. That's one of my paintings there of Cadrith in the Moonlight. It's called Gooseberry Moon actually. This chap, this chap here is a gooseberry. They two there are kissing and cuddling in the moonlight. And the stars are up in the moon and it's like night before last when we had a big moon around, a big ring around the moon. One of those nights it's flat cow stars was out and the shadows from the moon on the beach. Done by memory. <laughs> and another one at Cadwith. This particular pi picture is um, is about five five or six years old. Cause that's the first tractor we had down the cove. And I've given it to Sally because I to Sally and I got love you on there. With a drop in the wind and a new crew, expectations of a good catch 
soon comes to an end when equipment fails. Yeah, the casing was uh, aluminium pulled away, but it's jamming up until we part it. This has been rubbing on the boat now. Probably why we never caught any fish last night. Big in. Hello, John. Martin has applied to MAF for a grant in the hope of raising enough money to purchase a sonar. That's right, and this would be far more efficient at finding pilchards. Project for Pesca. So that could well be about £3,000. That would be most helpful and we might be able to get a sonar put in there then. Perseverance finally pays off and on his next trip Martin catches eight tonnes of pilchards. Well, it's eight o'clock we shut the net, and it was three o'clock time we finished getting the fish in the boat, and then, then the hole, the fish made a, made a hole in the net, and they all, all the rest of them escaped, because there was such, ever such a lot more in the net than what I was, what eight ton was. George Rinnicombe is probably the most experienced man in the southwest of England fishing, and he still goes out, and he's, he, he's, he had no spring chicken anymore, but he's still going out there and uh, been ever so helpful. Oh, another thing, just now, um, Jed, Sally, who's just been on the phone and told, told um, Penny, you're in the bank manager, we caught some fish. So she said, I can stay on hold until April and see if we can carry on catching and get on my feet a bit. So the bank manager's happy. That's a good thing, George, isn't it? <laughs> He's happy. If you can keep the bank manager happy, you're all right. Yeah. Don't worry about nobody. And the wife. Yeah. <laughs> Well, she's been happy when I haven't been catching any. He hasn't found credit. <laughs> so that's all right. I ain't got to say nothing about that. No. <laughs> well, I'm happy and I'm not really no money. Oh, you weren't talking about financial. <laughs> well, in the crow's nest, we're cautiously optimistic, enjoying it very much, my partner Jilly and myself. Um, Martin's not so happy, not getting a very good price for the pilchards. He's not feeling a very happy man at the moment. He's got the crew, he's got the weather, the boat's working well. The fingers crossed. Well, it, this is like seventh heaven coming down here. It's, it's a real escape and it just gets you out of all the, the fray and all the things that are going on at home, trying to get the books sorted out and keeping Martin in a jovial mood. And this is really good. <laughs> they are exactly 65, well, thank you very much. Good. Would you like so, it in a bag? Or well, are you going to carry it and show it off? I'll here? show it off. You yeah. will. Oh, he bought that for me. Yeah. Thank you, darling. Oh, there you go. What do you think? I thought that was Martin's that? boat, and I realised it's the wheelhouse for it. You've got the sonar in, and uh, that's gone great. I just brought her back today. and I've come home to see the fishing news because there's really good write-up in the fishing news here of with disappointing results following the eight ton catch martin can well do without the next phone call that has arisen from the article and one of the mishaps i i had before the penrose sunk was some scholars told me gear away and my gear was going to go to the bank seeing i borrowed twenty thousand pound for the penrose and I got home just now and found a message on the phone from one of the scallopers which were working in the area of where my gear was. It's a bit, a bit distressing. Anyway, have a listen. Now I was not the man that towed that gear away, but I want you to state you've accused a local scallopers. Now that's an accusation that you've got to back up. Now if you've got the proof of it, bloody prove it. Because I'm sick and fed up with the accusations. I was not the man that told your gear away. Well, that was quite, quite something. This man was in the area and uh, we can't prove that it was him or anybody else.
New boots for a new job. As more people leave the fishing industry, it's difficult to get replacement crew. Martin is lucky to have found a young bunch of lads who are willing to try life at sea. He explains to his inexperienced crew the complications and dangers of shooting a large ring net. I thought we'd have any problem with shooting away, but if we're going to have a problem shooting away, we might as well shoot away with the fish in the net and have a problem. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If we wait till coming in a little bit dark between two lights and let them give it a go, at least we've got a chance of catching them, whereas we wouldn't catch them if it's daylight, like now, exactly. too early. Yeah. Right. Biggest fuck up we've ever seen. And I can't explain why now because it's not doing any good. All hands, come here. Gah. The wire went out too slow. All the net went right over there. The circle wasn't big enough because you made it so short the wire one went out. You've got to get the feel wire going out. I'm in the shit so much I don't know what to do. You're ready to first up. See that guy. When the boat rolls, it goes down a foot like, you know, yeah. and that's when you do it to get it out. Right. Doing a good job, man. Looking all right. Prevail moored up for the night. There's time to reflect and learn from the evening events. Youthful enthusiasm and Martin's eternal optimism combine to lift their spirits as they settle down for the first night aboard. Well, I'd rather do that. Save me spending. Them. Good night, John boy. Good. <laughs> Just after I phoned, phoned talking to you on the phone, 
tide slacked off and because there's quite a bit of tide it must have parted out on the rudder and uh, the net went away because it was wrapped around us. The net actually went away on its own and it had a big rope, this big rope here tied on it and shut it away, give it a bit of stick and parted it out. It's extremely frustrating. I quite often say that, don't I? I get fed up with saying it. But on Sunday, we brought a punt, punt around and moored up in the Garen's Bay. And seeing I had problems last night and the night before, I wasn't able to get it. When I went in to get it just now, <laughs> local man from Port Scatho said, I got your punt, we Harbour Master gotten. He said, the uh, customs and excise was wondering what was happening. Farm of Coast Guards and Carrick District Council, and they all wondering who left the punt there. And they thought it might have been bodies or rum or brandy or drugs or something like that. There's no name on the punt. So I just been in Port Scatho to get the punt back. What a flipping week! Oh, what a year! Well, what three years we've been happy. I'm coming home, be home in about four, three hours. And I, yeah, I rip my neck. Ripped it up, so we'll have, have a bit of sleep. Take it off tomorrow. All right. Yeah, uh, thanks for finally went. Love you. Bye. Family having a nice day on the beach. Loads of visitors. as if we got a mend in it, it's just lacing it up and just tie it there and bring it together. A bit like my shirt, but laced up. Me and Sally have been very worried about the situation as the um, bank said we aren't allowed to use any more checks. Been to the bank again and she's let me have some more money on the overdraft facility so as I can pay some, some of the red bills which some of the people were getting. More, more than concern, they said it's going to be a going to be court proceedings the following week, which was last Monday. So last Friday, I went to the bank. After four days at sea, supplies running out, and no sign of pilchards, ah. Martin looks for an alternative catch: mullet, which swim near the surface during hot weather. Really want to win, Cormac? Get your um, backy, eh, don't he? Bloody well, eh? <laughs> I'm glad I don't smoke anymore. Terrible habit getting addicted with that. Yeah, it's not that, it's just bugger all to do over and over. Fine. Go to sleep <laughs> then. Oh, you sleep. Go to sleep. Yeah, I don't want to sleep. I'm not tired. Well, if you're bored, go read a book. Go on, you book to me. Nope. Well then. Bye. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> They're gone up there, like young sailors striding through their own little, quaint little village of Kovrak, gone in the main store to get some, get some more grub for our next journey into the unknown. <laughs> like my t-shirt. Eh? Sally bought it for me. Shot away about 8.30. And we must have got all the fish aboard by about 20 past 12. Yeah, it's now 4.30 the following morning. Yeah, 4.30 following morning. And we're still uh, landing. time too, in it? Handsome, three ton that time. <laughs> Nutty done it. Hopefully it'll be a lot more to come. Let's have a good price, should we say 50 pence? I don't want to go any lower than 40 pence. 40 pence, if you want to stack 40p. 
we had a mention on the Radio Cornwall, so that was good. Andrew Munson, who talks on Radio Cornwall about what fish being caught in Newlyn, he mentioned that the, uh, I, th I think he said the only Cornish ringnetter to be working for Pilchers landed some fish this morning, so that was nice. And we got BBC television crew coming out, doing some filming, like you do, Jed, on catching them. The promise of wages from the last catch has fired up the team to hunt the pilchard again. So no time is wasted in returning to sea. At last, just like his ancestors before him, Martin has become the pilcher catcher he had dreamed of. But at what a cost. It's taken three long years, the sinking of Penrose, trips to Ireland and France, but most of all, Martin has caught himself under the burden of huge debts. The high spirits were short-lived. Once again, Martin is knocked back. All his efforts are rewarded with no buyers and rock-bottom prices, as most of this catch will go for fish meal. Unlike years gone by, today's pilchers are not in great demand, and Martin is forced to wake up to the reality that hard work doesn't always equal profit. Realistically, how long do you think you can carry on like this? Not much longer really, I don't think, because the bank has asked us to revalue their assets. So time could be very short. So we've got to revalue the house. And they want the, um, the registration of the boat, just in case things go worse and uh, they take the house and take the boat. I think I'm your biggest asset at the moment. Well, if it weren't for you bailing me out to <laughs> proverbial, I would have mm. gone under financially long ago. Mm. Another bill and Barclay card. How do you think we're going to pay that? Don't know. Come down to me tether. Well, I can't do no more than what I've done. Out to Croft here today to have a bit of think. My great granddad, who was here for the pilchard industry down the cove, and he wouldn't get beat by the system. If there isn't any markets there to be developed, he'd say, Come on, boy, pull your finger out. Do it yourself. If they aren't going to buy them, you can catch them, cook them yourself. I've got a secret recipe. We'll prepare them with Sally, my missus, and Anna, my cousin, my daughter. My daughter's there and they'll be giving me a hand. We'll have a taste in the evening 
down the cove with a pilchard. That sounds a good idea, doesn't it? Well, good luck, Mark. Well, we need a bit of luck now, don't us? <laughs> yeah. These here pilchards are marinated herself for the last 24 hours and we've got a secret recipe in there and uh, they are all tasting handsome. I hope you enjoy them as well and when you do take a questionnaire away with you and put a little tick in the box appropriately. And, um, if you're going to be sick, there's special little, <laughs> special little boxes in the corner and serviettes. And uh, I hope you enjoy them. What a mug shot. I had an idea as well. Excuse me, Jeff. I said, what a mug shot. Oh, and beautiful, isn't it? I can see how you, how you married how me I, by my how I think you're so looks and wit and humour. <laughs> I've even licked my plate. They were that good. Handsome. <laughs> Here, I see you've got that right, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Chris. The past three years have been an emotional roller coaster for me, as well as Martin. It was over a cup of tea that Martin told me of his plans to rediscover the pilchard fishery. I was caught up in his boundless enthusiasm and suggested I followed him with my camera. Little did I know then what I was letting myself in for. At times I've found it very draining and others I've burst my sides with laughing. It's been difficult knowing when to draw this to a close, but I think the right time is now and I wish Martin and Sally success in his latest idea. It's been one hell of an adventure. Yeah. And, uh, I just hope things work out for you in the future. Um, what was your thoughts on our, on the tasting session? Pretty darn good, yeah. We've had well over 100 people here, and uh, these questionnaires have been filled out handsomely. The uh, middle one here is, is the three little boxes. It's handsome, not bad, or horrible. And most of them are handsome. I reckon we cracked it, Jay. I reckon this is answer. Instead of catching them in bulk, and middleman kept getting so much money, like one buyer said on the tele the other day, if a fisherman don't like it, you can set up shop yourself. So I think we're gonna just set up shop with our team we got here. Because um, nobody was sick. <laughs> and uh, let's hope things are gonna be right. So <laughs> uh, no, thanks for filming me and uh, giving me the opportunity to do something like this, Jed. <laughs> right, cheers old buddy. All the best, Mark. Right on, Jen. we saw Martin known as Nutty Noah with a dream of becoming a pilchard fisherman. With the support of his wife Sally, Nutty dealt with the sinking of his boat Penrose, market failures and huge financial debts. But still with all that he managed to fulfil his dream. After three long years we left them, serving pilchards prepared in a secret recipe and with the hope of producing and selling them themselves.
another fisherman is in the dust. Ah, I hope I won't be going in the bin, but this little chap is. I've got to move into a couple of caravans to uh, get some money coming in when we let the house out so as we can keep up the bank payment for the boat. And uh, got more cobwebs and clutter than I've ever seen. <laughs> 15, 16 years of uh, accumulating things. And over the next couple of days we shall be uh, moving out and hopefully three or four days time we'll be in their caravans. As long as we've got a freezer and, and the gun, I think we'll be all right. Oh good, on the land. The more one is closed, don't they? Oh, I hope that was breakable, whatever that was in there. It sounds good. There's only black and white, but he's a picture. <laughs> well, What's best to do? Martin and Sally's move to the good life at their so-called ranch is locally well known. Among the animals they've been offered is a dying ferret. This takes up precious time that should be spent on preparing for the arrival of the new tenants. But Martin is in no rush. Well, I mean, he, he's quite an old ferret, isn't he? Mm. Uh, well, he, he got a very great lump there where we're even doctored, like, you know? Uh. He didn't, and lovely animal he is. Shame, because he's a lovely animal. Yeah. He yeah. Quit, or I put my hand there, he lick my bloody arm yeah, up and down. And yeah, we'll, we'll have him. We'll have him. And um, when he get too bad, I'll do something by him. Yeah. yeah. Deal done, just as a couple arrive. Yeah, we'll be well. You'll be sorted out soon. Then. Yeah, another couple, three days, we'll be all right. Yeah. And now Martin's been caught on the hop. Lopped the tree off and a little branch off in Mother's with a chainsaw, standing on the back of the truck, and I misjudged it. I mean, it flipping the windscreen. Get a new windscreen, and they're glued in. Well, that's a big old change, really, Mark. Very big change. A bit frightening, really, Jed, because he's, he's serious, isn't it? The amount of money I got to find is astronomical now. He's, you know, they, uh, the banks want want so much money because I sort of put on hold. Uh, it's cost money, isn't it? They're like 700 quid a month now. So I've got to catch a lot of sharks, haven't I? And I aren't able to go because I'm moving out. If the carpet isn't pulled out from underneath my feet, perhaps I'll try next week to go fishing. And uh, like I said, I haven't been for about a month. And with the failure of the pilchards in the market and all, I just can't go of it below. So. I do catch a shark, so hopefully people don't do gooders, don't give me too much grief. After the problems encountered with health and safety, cooking his own pilchards never got off the ground. And so Martin returned to sharking. He spent months tracking the shoals, and then in December last year, his horizons looked a lot brighter when he caught 150 sharks in one week. But he wasn't prepared for the uproar and worldwide news coverage this would bring. Another day out on the briny. We got force force four easterly and we don't know whether we're going to catch anything because this is quite a rough day for this method of fishing but we're hopeful you guessed four didn't you jay and i guessed 12 and he hasn't said nothing all he said was he was sick sicked up my dinner
Some lovely sight, Mark. Very sight, did you? Handsome. Oh, flipping excellent. Yeah, on cloud nine. Yeah. Oh. I hope we carry on. How many shirts have you got there, Mark? How many you got? I think about 60 shirts, I think. 50 or 60. That's, that's mega unusual. Oh, it? God. Most of them were four, like 16. That's a good catch. But this time, they were, they were coming up thick and fast, you know? So well, well worth persevering, because all summer we've been trying and trying all the time. Dwindling fish stocks have led one Cornish fisherman to trawl for an unusual catch, a shark. In just a couple of trips, he landed more than 100, and he's going back for more. Conservationists are worried about the impact on the shark population. Well, John Kay is in Newlyn. John. Well, Sophie, it's not that unusual for fishermen to catch the odd poor beagle shark in these waters here. This one has just been landed in the last few minutes, but nobody's ever heard of one man catching as many as 128 in a single week. How did he do it? Well, he was targeting them specifically, and conservationists say that is a very dangerous precedent. One, two, three. Hup. Another one that didn't get away. Reba, Reba, Reba! <laughs> Look at the size of that one! When Martin Ellis got back to shore, he couldn't believe his eyes. In all, 128 sharks, a profit of £7,000. Pick up your hook. Today, he showed me how he used hooks and mackerel bait to catch a haul that has changed his life. To actually get into some heavy fishing like this and earn some serious money has been well, like manna from heaven. It's taken him two years to find a spot where sharks are so plentiful, but conservationists say it's a dangerous precedent which could soon lead to extinction. Very shortly, the, the numbers will drop there won't be any around for the other fishermen, the populations will have gone, and we'll have lost a highly evolved, very elegant predator from British waters. Shark meat is popular on the continent, but tonight, as this massive haul was packed up for export, environmentalists pleaded with fishermen to stop targeting the creatures. Those conservationists say that sharks simply can't reproduce and repair themselves in great numbers quickly enough. But fishermen here are saying they can't be that endangered if one man can catch more than 120 in a single week. So Martin Ellis is planning to go out again tomorrow to catch some more, and he expects many other fishermen here to follow him. Further trips fail to produce another large catch for Martin. Well, there you are, look. Three, four big ones. 300 hooks, and that's reality, isn't it? 44 kilos we got here, call it 50 kilos, 100 quid. Might not go again for several days now because they get bad, got to get bad weather coming in, but um, still you get condemned. Message received Tuesday, December 2nd at 1.31 p.m. You can tell your husband he's a bloody disgrace to Tornish men. He'll be dying with them sharks. Martin's excitement of providing desperately needed wages is soured by the bad press and death threats. He tries to put it all behind him and concentrates on the houseman. New home. Sally's mother is here with us and she's allowed us to come up here and uh, put these caravans here. She looked after us and we look after her. <laughs> There's still laws and regulations on the animals, the same as at the sea. You've got to tell Defra how many pigs you've got and tell them how many chickens you've got. I don't think they want to know how many eggs you've got yet, but that won't take long for them to find that out. Poor little things, they've got no feathers on their fronts, because that's all they had to do all day, is to peck their feathers out. Kept them in a battery, I expect, was they? Yeah, they were. Oh, there's another one. Oh, you clever little girl is. Yes, you are. Well, we haven't actually moved in yet, but we're very happy of both of us. You want something to eat, my little darlings? Come on out, play a little wall. Dog in, ferrets out. There's that old dog, Jed. The dog ferret that Michael, the chap, hadn't, hadn't for a bit of a while. He, he was bold at the time, and now he's, all his fur has come back, and he's been 
Been playing with the youngsters, and I found a good way of cleaning the saucepan. Oh no! After scrambled egg, they chew off most of it. That is disgusting. <laughs> Well, moving up here, I'm calling it Nutty Nose Ranch. We've had a taste of the good life. And being a fisherman, I know nothing about pigs and chickens. I only know a little bit about ferrets, that's all. My cousin, Andrew Stevens, he found them at sea. Very thick pieces of wood, uh, I cut them in half. Sally creosoted them. And um, we'll make a lean to. Mind your head. Uh, I've got my work cut out for me over the next few months. Putting across members across here as I go. And um, should be all hunky dory. And I've got to do a bit of accurate sawing with a chain to get the beans on. I got grade, grade one jetting. GSE. It's not surprising that Martin's got cats on his mind. There have been local sightings of large wild cats and Moana, his daughter, was frightened when out riding one evening. Went in there to have a little canter round. Um, walked in and then Clem chased a rabbit, so I sat on the pony laughing my head off. Oh, fuck, kind of funny. And then I looked over into the far corner, over on the left, cor left hand corner, and I just saw this black, black panther, and it just ran straight along the field and it was just pure black and very sleek and it didn't make eye contact with me and it just ran straight for the bushes. Dog was going absolutely mad. Horse was all over the place. She his shoe was looking in the direction and like walking around in circles like trying to calm her down, trying to calm herself down, trying to use the phone, <laughs> trying to tell dad. Martin being a natural born hunter can't resist tracking down others with tails of the big cat. Something must have made me look up to my left. Mm. As I glanced up in the tree, something I can describe as dark, animal, very long, went at that sort of angle down mm -hmm. the tree. Mm. I sort of kind of half got up because I thought, what on yeah. earth is that? Mm. And at that point, it must have gone around, and there's woodlands behind here. Oh, yeah. And not long after that, there was... This was the more frightening bit, the noise of something crashing and thrashing. Um, and that noise went on for quite a while. And it right. was at that point that I did start to get Word. a bit nervous. Yeah. And I mean, I've walked these cliffs for years and years. 
there's yeah. never been nervous around them, but it was the noise that was the frightening yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, I bet. What in the hedge? You see that house? Yeah. It's just a feel that Moena and my daughter saw him in last night, up somewhere between 10 to him, 5 to 8. It must be about that time now. It might be a bit later, a bit earlier. But he came out of that corner there and went in this corner while she was on a pony in the middle of this meadow. So we're here waiting to see if he'd come along the same track. What I found out, the local chap from Lizard called Billy Lovell, seen him before. He's, um, he, he'd been chasing crows in the corn arrow field, other side of the hedge. So, they crows and gulls are quite often have a rest up before they go roost. And uh, he might be lying awake for they. So it's hang fire here for half half hour, quarter an hour to, while it's still light to see if we can see him. But it might, I must emphasize, it might not be the same one as down at Poltesco. Because I think Billy Lovell seen it here the same day as Sir Fox seen the other one in Poltesco, so I reckon there's two. I'm certainly getting more sightings from as we look into this, more pe more and more people are seeing them. What we might be able to do, he'd come out in the field and I might be able to squeak like a mouse. I got my hand in the grass to get to make out he is a mouse here having a scrap with two mice fighting. I've done that with foxes before now and they come up really close to you. So if you do come out and they start squeaking, be prepared to switch her on and see if we can get a close up view of the Black Panther. The night long vigil was unsuccessful, but Martin wasn't deterred. He later went to meet artist and dozer Bart O'Farrell at Prothalo, where a large footprint was found. That's sightings of black cats in this area. Soon all you know up at uh, my neighbour. Mm -hmm. And also um, Amanda, um, not Amanda, um, Diane Donahue over at Prowstock. Yeah. So we know there is something appearing and disappearing in this area yeah, yeah. Of, of a size. Um, but uh, I mean, this is this is a big paw print. Yeah. What tells you it's a cat? Um, <laughs> was it a dog? That's my no. Was it of the cat family? That's my yes. That's 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 how I think it's a cat. And the paw prints are certainly quite impressive. And it's carrying some weight. Um, even, even though the ground is, is soft, um, you've got to be our sort of weight to make an impression in, in, in the ground. So it, it's, it's, it's got a heaviness to it. I, it is a phenomenon. Um, it's amazing that Ted spotted it and picked it up, but I'm thrilled a bit so that he asked me in as a dowser um, because this is discussed in dowsing circles and uh, I've actually been able to douse this phenomenon and I'll probably send a note off into the dowsing magazine, see what they make of it. Further sightings in the area brings professional tracker Ian Maxwell to Trigger Minion. I think that's, I think that's where, it's, where it's gone through the bit that's been milled to do the same. Yeah, I don't know, to be honest. Well, I mean, we'll have a look around this, actually, because there'll be more around here. Well, Ian haven't found any tracks yet. He's been unsure of the scratch marks. I would have thought that where we first looked on that edge, probably put some bait there, I don't know. Bit of salted down. Steak you got them, eh? Right, at the bottom of the valley, there's a track or a trail that's been used a lot. Cows have obviously got out fairly recently, but there's a lot of that. Okay. It's longer in a cow's hair, is it? It's, uh, yeah, this is lower down than a, than a cow's hair. Okay, because that's what we're going to look for now because there's definitely a predator down there and we just got to find more of these bits of rabbit, bits of crow. Inspired by Ian's methods, Martin returns to Poltesco to do his own tracking. 
but in his excitement, he temporarily forgets that cats bury their turds. We have to look into what the uh, excrement is looking like of this panther, Jed, because um, this is in the same place where dogs go to the toilet, and I wouldn't have thought that would be in a dog. I don't know, but there's all sorts of seeds in there and bits of grass. I know dogs eat grass to make themselves sick, but that's rabbit fur or rat fur. Look. See that? Uh, there wouldn't be an owl pellet, would it? Too big. And yet you've got seeds, fur. That's definitely fur, look. Another interesting bit of information we've got a very good old school friend of ours, Jed's and mine, called Charlie Horner. He saw it probably five or six years ago, I'm not sure when. It's over the top of that hill, the other side of Innis, Cadriff side of Innis. On the footpath, he had his head in the bushes and he came around the corner and seen it. Oh, the panther had his head in the bushes, not Charlie. <laughs> but he, he got pretty close to him and he was a bit frightened at the, at the time because he could, could have got a got up closer to it but he took the panther got his head out of the bushes and looked at him in the eye and turned and went the other way and it startled him quite a bit because he was wondering who was who was going to have to give way and I took, took my torna my daughter out there to see the footprints and we actually saw the footprints I think it's you hunting cats is forgotten about as Martin concentrates on weather proving his new home he stank right through the concrete oh, I tell you what you want to put the watering can over that Tamp it down a bit. I've beaten around the back head with a piece of wood. <laughs> Coming on, generous. Like all of us on a budget, necessity is the mother of invention. Nice bit of carpet. Chicken wire to keep them up there. Plywood on top of the carpet. Any old bit of plywood, thin stuff, and then the galvanised. And, uh, all the way down to that corner and that way and doing the shut up so it's coming on I thought I'd better have a bit of a flat floor in here the concrete floor from here up long so we've got a sewerage to put in down through and a digger coming next week to put the giant onion in the ground for the septic tank so we're coming on by degrees. You want to try that mattress out because I'm sure there's not enough room for me on there. It don't look a lot for me. <laughs> Come on. You're going to stay the same side, Zorus. I'm yes, I'm on the I'm on the side. You're on the starboard side. <laughs> it was port side. Right there. No, your your head's touching the thing. Now your feet are hanging over the end. Look. Well, your arms in the way. Drop a drop of wine and it'll be. Move your arm out of the way. <laughs> Give me some room. I think we need a bigger I, mattress. I think we need a bigger mattress too. That would be right for tired now. <laughs> Let's go get the big mattress. Oh. I can't cope with this. I got a job get out my son. I need to skid across this one. Yeah, that's the trouble. I'm thinking of you skidding across me.
Mr. From Behind, you go quicker than that. Is it wrong way around? Oh, the girls are in there painting the caravan out, soft reds and yellows and blues. Well, that's coming on now. <laughs> painting up a bit, Jed. Thought we'd make it a bit nicer, a bit home more homely than the old granny fight that was here before. What do you think of it, Jed? Plenty of roof area here now. All sealed up pretty, nailed down. We had a gale of force 10 to 11 easterly, nor'easterly yesterday, putting a good test to it. Never leaked the drop. Well, he was one of them drop, a couple actually. Vast expanse of galvanized. <laughs> Preparing for winter. Martin and Sally's 20 year wedding anniversary is celebrated with a barbecue at Kennick Oh my God, Tim! Hello! Oh, good to see you! Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> Good Good darling. Jamie, well, the card. Anniversary card. Well, that's very kind of you, Thank you very much. I do care for you. What beautiful flowers. <laughs> you know I like purple. Oh, oh. oh. I didn't realise how relevant it yeah, was. Yeah, absolutely. I thought you had electricity. No, not yet. You were supposed to do it on Tuesday and you didn't come. Naughty. Oh, well, you've got the card to keep you going. <laughs> He's going to have singing lessons while we're down. <laughs> as, as well as guitar lessons. As well as guitar. <laughs> no, we've all been on the summer holiday. Oh, I haven't been yet. But what you don't know is the treasure in the land and Well, we got married and got when and here we go to. Here we are, 20 years from now, and I think I don't think I aren't going to do it anymore. <laughs> close friends around us. It was brilliant. Mm. And all day today, people have been going past the crow's nest that came to the barbecue and saying, fantastic, absolutely great. Mm. We really, really thank enjoyed it. Yeah. And thank you for inviting us. I thought, you're our friends. That's right, I've got to invite there. you. Yeah. Oh, you mean them saying no, it? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you spend last night then? On the beach. <laughs> by the fire. <laughs> but I did go up the valley where they had a rave. 
I hope you don't don't mind and feel any uh, grudge against me on that, darling. But uh, that was the first time I ever been to a rave. Really? I didn't pop no pills, but, but I did have a little a little bit of smoke. Some great works of art are conceived when under the influence. Martin's imagination needed no influence when he recently decided to concentrate on his artwork. We've got to get into the art world. Expressive, abstract art. I'll explain to you what I've done here on a picture of Cornwall. Silver represents tin. The veins represent the people of Cornwall in the past. And the little dots represent tourism coming down onto the beaches. And the yellow haze is the covering up of the history and the life of Cornwall. The difficult thing about painting is knowing what to paint and how to paint it. Gone in the tight chance, see if we can get inspired, see how we get on. Oh, he's still blowing the gale dead. Oh, that was interesting. I enjoyed that bit of stank around up there. <clears throat> All I got to do now is go and cut my dog in half. <laughs> God, what some people call art. As others to grizzle at. Go and get scattered over here, son. Cars everywhere, people everywhere. Pretty place, though. Must have been pretty years ago. There's galleries here, you know. Handsome. From quaint little places. Narrow. Nice to see it. Hello there. Some of that art, you know, flipping. Can't call it art, can he? Well, some people do, they must buy in. My great grandfather come from here, you know? I'll tell you about that one day. Olsen and I saying, cheers to the Pope and may the blood of our loved ones run down the street. And that's what they used to do. The blood of the loved ones was the pilchards. It's a pilchard industry. When they squash the pilchards, see, the blood and all the oil used to run down the street. If it wasn't for the fish, it wouldn't survive. If you mind paint, artwork might be on the cell and doing casually. We seem to have hung together and uh, gone through gone through a bit of a rough time. Marriage is still strong. My two daughters are around me and the wife. And uh, we settle in here now with, with the pigs and the chickens and the ferrets and, and a couple, three doves and a, guinea pigs and rabbits. It's quite nice, really. <laughs> Did you get those pheasants, Jed? they just gone round up past here. They're a little bit shy at the moment because they're a bit shy of these chickens. But I'm hoping to breed the, the pheasants with these chickens. And I'm going to call them fez chicks. They're, it's a little scheme I got. I think I might make a, make a little fortune on this because they're for the shooting syndicates. And for the shooting people who can't shoot fast flying pheasants, these will be low, slow ones. In my imagination, I would have thought they would go. Something like that. Judging by what these are making. What we've got to do now is uh, concentrate on a, on a party, a housewarming party, well, a caravan warming party, really, and my birthday. You get a focal point on parties, don't you? Uh, Sally doesn't really want me to spit roast one of the pigs. Unfortunately, it's one of those little stumbling blocks I get to get over. She's quite adamant I aren't going to do it, but a bit like North American Indians or the Aborigines and all that, you've got, you've got to have somewhere people meeting and relaxing and having a good time. And one of you is going to accompany me to my party. Yes! Is it going to be you? Dear old boy. I like apple sauce on a bit of pork. 
there's a lot of beer going to be consumed and when beer going one end he got great the other I did think about having the toilets the other side of the caravan plastic all the way along there they'll, they'll smell the uh, horse manure make them feel it out the men's will be here now and have a pee again in the caravan and the ladies will be around the back probably I'll get a bucket with we'll put a bit of foam on it and uh, probably a bit of loo paper on a bit of binder twine around the back I could use, even use the pig trough and the hose for a bidet if anybody wants to be ultra clean. What I thought was we have a party tricks. I mean, youngsters, when they have parties, they always have little games, don't they? My game is going to be. Let's see it. If anybody. <laughs> if anybody can. <laughs> It's like rabbit pee. Oh, we've got that bowl to put the joint in this. When were they shot? Last night. Looks like he's got slippers on. Hey? Looks like he's got slippers on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll make a stew up for everybody. Everybody's gonna have a good nosh up. What's up, dark stew? No. Throw it a bit in, do you? Ah! Must have smoked some rabbit on your broidery. Nice and warm in here. You mustn't lean again, that, so you might get burned. We get one going now, Jay, shall us? Onions and salt and water. I ain't got nothing else at the moment. Right, I don't know, Martin. I'll pick three up some glasses when I come back out. Alright, Dan. Thank you. Right, we can barbecue the long ones. We want to make out he's a pig. We're experimenting. Next year we'll have to have a pig. See, and Sally don't want us to do that. One of those pigs, which is a bit of a lash. But... Martin put six on the death reform. And this is now the third time that I've told him that I crossed it out and put seven. Oh. And he, he's, he's doing, yeah, you see, he's making out, he doesn't know. Can you please not make it an issue today? I had enough the other night. You spoiled my dinner, I put Peter and Anne's, by going on about it. Will you let me speak and don't interrupt me? Don't make an issue of it today, because I don't want the day ruined. All right? Yeah, all done, all ready to go. That's men's for it, sorry. Men's for it, for the leg dress. <laughs> no roast pork, and not everyone's a lover of rabbit stew. It's actually nice, but I can't try it. Thank you. Oh, Eat, it. Eat it. Eat it. Mm. That's a good thing. That was good. Oh, that was just sick. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. 
you want to go to the bar to get another pipe? I might slightly feel slightly intoxicated. I, I feel very proud to stand in front of all my friends and you get the <laughs> centre of attraction on me saying something funny next. Never erected a chimney before in my life at all, and away the river. Did you know this wood burning stove is in my mother's bungalow? With just a few left around the fire, Martin breaks into song about Molly's wood burner. My friend bought the chimneys to me today. And we wrecked it by fire. We got it going and we made a rabbit stew on my lovely fire. On my lovely fire. Tired of it. I'm before a pop. No, no, darling. Don't forget look underneath your bed for monsters. Some party, chap. My last present, which was this morning, from Anne's pasty shop. Uh, have a guess what's in this box. Retallic beef and lizard teddies. And here she is, look. That's some pasty, isn't it? Look at this, look. From the lizard. Plenty of onion with love. I want another painting. I've done a painting of a catch of sharks. The first catch of sharks I had about 15 years ago. I must painted it and she's got it. So she wants me to do another painting. How could you eat that parrot? They obviously seem shipped in sands. After the party, it's time for Martin to face reality. His hopes and dreams of keeping prevail and earning a living from the sea has finally got to come to an end. Literally today is another start in another chapter in my life and it has been emotional for me this last few hours before you got here because this is the end. Shall I know, Sean? Yeah, I've had enough. I've thrown the towel in dead and uh, I think I've given it a barrel crack. I rented a house out to get some money in to uh, pay for the boat which is still paying for the boat right at this moment. I think more than likely the house will have to go up for sale within the next week or two. Because even if we sold the boat for 40 grand, I'm 100,000 pound in debt, and it's gone in, and just I just lost a lot of money. The, when I bought the license, I lost six grand. The engine went and broke down. Uh, I had to buy that big ring net, which we went over France for. That was four and a half grand. All those things adding up, adding up, 100,000. I can't believe it. but. Uh, when I'm home, I haven't missed it that much because I'm not near the sea. But I'm going to miss the sea if I uh, go near it. <laughs> After telling the family that he's resigned to the fact that the house and prevail have to be sold, Martin goes on to say. Another thing, girls, what we've got to consider is grandma and grandpaps, my mum and dad. Um, as we know, two or three days ago, the Paps has got cancer. And he's got cancer in the eye, and it, he's got to either have chemotherapy or have his eye removed. And I can't think of anything worse, can you have, have your sight gone from it? But Grandma's going to be a bit stressed out as well. But think about your mum and your grandma a little bit more. Because although you've got a life you're leading, and it's quite hectic, like it is in children's heads, but you've got to think of us more, all right, love you both. Not willing to dwell too long on serious matters, Martin soon changes the mood. <laughs> you should see a pig when he's pissed, it's so funny. <laughs> we had a, a umdinger of a party and ne next day, well it was a couple of days after actually, um, I had several pints of beer and then all of the barrels came in the bucket and half a beer. <laughs> I, I scratched them behind the ear and then given them a tickle around the tongue and he fell over in the mud and got stuck. 
<laughs> That's why my pub is called the Tiddly Pig. <laughs> he actually died happy because he was eating at the time. And I didn't like doing it. It was it was a bit um, funny old feeling actually killing an animal which you've been scratching and you've been squeaking away and I liked him dearly but he had a lovely life and we got a face up to it we got to eat. Been in the trade now all of one hour and it's, it's knowing where to have the, the right appropriate cut. I expect the butcher would be laughing You don't know how to do anything, you just gotta try. Do your best. I think we've got a bit wrong, I don't know. I'm sure I'm doing it wrong, but I'm always thinking what's gonna fit in the other. Do you? Shoulder with it. The money we get from the eggs, paying for the chicken food and paying for the pig food. And this here, it's his belly. And what I like to do, I seen it on a shop in on television the other day, put the herbs and the salt on there, roll it up, tie it up with string and put it in the oven and go down for a few pints. And have a few more and come back and have a good nosh up along with a few friends. Right, so pick up a bag and we'll start bagging her up. Right. Yeah. We'll have a bit of pork like you know, you got one of these in there. Belly. Belly. Another belly. No, not that one. Hey, where's the pork? Been given a bit of pork to Sydney, local fish and chip man. First fish and chip. And he's down room minor tonight, so off we go to give him a bit of pork for a place or a bit of cold. Come in. been doing quite a bit of bartering. These chips are handsome, aren't they? Yes, they really are. Good old Sid. What's it like now, living 24 hours a day with Martin and so <laughs> You want the truth? <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> Can't kiss you, darling. We'll do it directly. <laughs> and kiss. <laughs> you cheeky boy. At the end of troubled waters, I said goodbye to Martin and Sally, but I soon realised there had to be a follow-on. I watched Nutty revive the pilchard fishery and felt its enthusiasm and despair. Now the house and prevail have been sold, the banks have been paid, and Martin and Sally have found contentment at Nutty's ranch. But I'm not sure for how long. Nutty's just like an old sea dog, he has salt water in his veins. How long, I wonder, will he be satisfied reliving memories and feeding the gulls?